Well, I, I'm Gerald Chan. I'm the uh, chair for this session. Um, I thought I was just going to come to this conference and chill for a couple of days, and Luke uh, gave me this job of uh, chairing this session. Now, a good thing is that all the speakers this, in this session, they are so well known, so I simply say they need no introduction. <laughs> I was particularly intimidated by, you know, how eloquent was um, uh, Thomas' uh, introduction, you know, of the speakers. Uh, I, not having done my homework, <laughs> I simply will cover my tracks and say they need no introduction. <laughs> uh, but I, I will frame these three talks, you know, um, and, and, and very well-known speakers by making three very brief points. Number one, Leroy Hood will talk to us about systems biology. Now, I had the pleasure of sitting next to Lee for dinner last night with David McConnell, and David reached over and asked the question to Lee, what has system biology taught us? <laughs> and they two engaged in a conversation, and I could see, you know, someone like David coming from a more reductionist tradition of science. Uh, what does this uh, system stuff teach us? Um, indeed, I think system, the system approach or this system worldview of, of life is a new epistemology in science that in addition you know, to a reductionist approach, we should you know, look at life as a system and using methods you know, used for analyzing systems to look at life. And that is what Leroy will talk to us today. Um, the second point I will make is that all three speakers today in these sessions, they have been pioneer, pioneers and innovators in tools. Um, Leroy started this company called Applied Biosystems as early as the 1980s, uh, which did you know, sequencing of uh, proteins, which uh, synthesized DNA, synthesized proteins, Fang, you know, of course, you know, is of CRISPR fame, and then uh, Carl Dieserhoff is, of course, of, uh, of optogenetics fame. Now, these are important milestones in science because so much of science now is tools de dependent. We get to know what we know because we have the tools to find out, you know, that discovery. So it is so important, you know, that all three speakers today they have been innovators in coming up with tools which then propel science to the next level or the next quantum level. Um, finally, I would say, you know, Leroy is going to talk to us about the future of medicine. Uh, medicine used to be an art. Uh, now it's much more evidence-based, which means that it has much more converged with science. Um, for medicine to be science-based, is also to say that science has become more applied and more interventional, and I'm really pleased to hear the talks this morning that science is not only about uh, satiating our curiosity, which I absolutely celebrate about nature, but also with the scientific discoveries, you know, we can do something to make the world a better place. So I will start by welcoming Leroy Hood, who, again, needs no introduction. <laughs> well, it's uh, a, an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I love the uh, cast of speakers that's been selected, but uh, most especially, I like the idea that there are students here uh, that hopefully will get them excited about science and move in that direction in their future. And in fact, in talking about medicine, what I'd like to do is give you a, a pre of my earlier career and a series of events that led to how I think about medicine today and then finally talk about how I think it's going to be changed in the future. Uh, I went to Caltech in uh, 1970, and at that time, was enormously interested in human biology, but daunted by its uh, enormous complexity and the lack of tools that existed to at least begin dealing from the data point of view 
uh, with that complexity. But you'll see, starting from that point of view to where we are today, there are three uh, big lessons that I think uh, I'd like to have you take home. One, the idea of scientific or quantitative wellness, and it's a new approach to uh, optimizing health for individuals. Number two, it actually provides a path forward to avoiding and dealing effectively with chronic diseases. And it's really going to strikingly decrease the cost of health care. So you'll get uh, a good discussion of one and two, uh, a little less discussion of three. But uh, as I said, when I went to Caltech, uh, the grand challenge, as I saw at the time, was thinking how little we knew about human beings and how few measurements we could make. And I started uh, at that time in a series of what I call seven different paradigm changes that dealt with that complexity but ultimately uh, framed my view of medicine. And the first idea was the idea of bringing engineering to biology. Over the years, we developed uh, six instruments, including automated sequencing of proteins and, and DNA and uh, synthesis of proteins and DNA and uh, the inkjet technology and so forth. And those technologies brought two things to biology. One, the ability to do high throughput biology on individual humans. And two, they began the accumulation of data that led to big data and its analytics. The automated sequencer got me invited to the first meeting ever held on the Genome Project. And of course, the Genome Project was incredibly transformational in two major ways. One, it gave us access for the first time to the variability of humans and the ability to correlate with wellness and disease phenotypes. And two, it gave us a complete listing, relatively complete listing, of genes and proteins so we could think about systems approaches to human complexity. The automated sequencer required putting together uh, physics, chemistry, engineering, uh, and molecular biology. And I got the idea that biology could really be driven in the future by this cross-disciplinary environment where leading-edge biology could push the development of new technologies and so forth, and uh, the new technologies could catalyze the analysis of new computational tools for dealing with the data. And Bill Gates made it possible in 1992 for me to go to the University of Washington and set up one of the first cross-disciplinary departments where people learn one another's languages and how to work together uh, effectively with one another. From there, in 2000, I resigned from the university to set up the Institute for Systems Biology. And that was this idea that we could look at biology in a holistic, global, cross-disciplinary, integrative manner centered about network biology, both in health and in disease, disease perturbed network biology. One of the interesting things we did in the first few years at the Institute was kind of define the framework for thinking about medicine for the next 15 years or so. Defining a systems approach to disease as systems medicine and defining uh, the idea that healthcare in the future should be predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory, and we call this 4P. Now, what the 4P medicine said is really healthcare should have two domains, one that deals with wellness, one that deals with disease. And of course, at that time, 99% of what healthcare did was, in fact, disease. So in 2014, I persuaded 108 of my friends to, for a year, go through deep phenotyping analysis to begin bringing in the data that would give us deep understandings of both wellness and disease. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. 
that year-long experiment then extended the next year with the start of a company called Aerovale, which bought scientific wellness, quantitative wellness, uh, to individual consumers. And we'll talk about data that's come from that in, uh, a little later in the lecture. And then finally, with all of these things we could concretely be able to do, the CEO of Providence St. Joseph's, a major healthcare system centered in Seattle, came and said, I'd like you to become my chief science officer and uh, ISB, uh, our research uh, branch. And after negotiation, we agreed to an affiliation, uh, which we had still complete control, that allowed us to bring P4 medicine into the healthcare system. And we'll talk about that. Now, systems biology brought a whole series of things to systems medicine. One, the idea of very deep phenotyping, and I'm going to talk about that in considerable detail later. Number two, the idea, as you've heard earlier this morning, that networks are hierarchical and they extend from molecules to cells to uh, organs to individuals to populations. And it's critical in understanding biology that we can integrate these hierarchical networks. And learning how to do that computationally has been one of the challenges of systems biology. We did develop a whole series of instruments, uh, targeted proteomics, single cell analysis, together, obviously, with many others, that I think have set us off in new, powerful directions for looking at uh, disease more effectively. And we've created, and we'll mention these obliquely, computational tools for really dealing with the big data that now today comes from systems biology. So in 2014, there were a convergence of these five different areas, systems biology and scientific wellness, and digital health, uh, big data, that's analytics and social networks. And these converged to define this P4 medicine ever more sharply. A medicine that, in contrast to contemporary medicine, was proactive, it was focused on the individual, it was all about wellness and disease. It used dense phenotyping, or the personal data clouds, to assess environmental and genetic contributions to disease. And it took a very different point of view toward drug discovery, where typically today you'll put 20,000 people into a population and give half a cancer drug and half a placebo, and you'll extract the data. And of course, the fundamental flaw is that basic assumption is that all of those 20,000 individuals are identical objects. And they aren't. They differ genetically and environmentally. So what P4 medicine does is it has 20,000 individuals, each with their unique data cloud, and you can stratify based on data from the individuals according to questions you're interested in. For example, the data clouds give us beautifully the power to identify biomarkers that can designate individuals respond to drugs as opposed to those that fail to respond to drugs. And just to give you an idea of how important that is, here are the top 10 selling drugs in the US today. The orange individual is the ratio uh, for each drug of individuals that respond. So it varies at best from 1 in 4 to, at worst, 1 in 25. And of course, if we did the individual personal networks, we'd immediately have the ability to identify the responders. And then you could go to clinical trials with all responders and do very small trials. And this is a point I'll return to again later. As I said earlier, P4 medicine is about these two domains, wellness on the one hand, disease on the other hand. And it was in 2014 when Nathan Price and I got together, convinced 108 of our friends to go through this very deep phenotyping. And as I've indicated earlier, the importance of the deep phenotyping is that if you look at the determinants of health, it's clear genetics makes a 30% contribution, environmental lifestyle makes a 60% contribution, 
and the healthcare system, not much at all. And of course, these personal data crowds, the dense phenotyping, give us the ability to assess the integrated effects of both genetics uh, and environment and, uh, and behavior. And what we did uh, to create the data clouds was complete genome sequence for each of the 108. Every three months, we analyzed about 1,200 analytes, clinical chemistries, proteins, metabolites. Every three months, we did the gut microbiome to quantify individual molecular species. And then we used the Fitbit and other devices for quantized self-measurements. And collectively, they uh, assembled data clouds for each individual that, when analyzed properly, led to actionable possibilities that could either improve an individual's health and let them avoid and or uh, uh, eliminate disease. And the approach that we took were to bring a small list of these actionable possibilities to each of the pioneers, as we term them, uh, every month through health coaches that played an incredibly important role in this process. They were the coaches that knew psychology and knew the biology of actionable possibilities so they could persuade really effectively people to begin lifestyle changes. They also educated the pioneers about scientific wellness. They were absolutely essential in the 70% compliance we got, which was really spectacular. And of course, they were key to long-term enrollment of these individuals in uh, the next stage of the program and everything. So the coaches played really an important role. And there are a lot of examples of actionable possibilities. And I'll just run through very quickly what we did was for the analytes, for the gut microbiome, for the genome variants and so forth, we called through the literature to look for disease-related and wellness-related actionable possibilities. And these included nutrition, inflammation, prediabetes, precardiovascular, genetic risk for more than 70 diseases, GWAS data. Uh, and the genetics can actually influence exercise uh, the type of diet you as an individual should have to be most effective. And, and they warn you of potential athletic injuries. There are 300 variants associated with that. We saw many uh, individuals over the years with uh, the most common Caucasian genetic disease in the US anyway, hemochromatosis, many examples of cancer and so forth, and so forth. There are a whole series of things that actionable possibilities and what happened is each individual had a long list of actionable possibilities, and we attacked them roughly three at a time and moved through those possibilities. Many people had really transformational experiences in what scientific wellness could do for them. And the, the vitamin D example is the one that I'll talk about because I was a pioneer and I had extremely low vitamin D values when I saw that, I started taking 1,000 international units. It didn't even boost my vitamin D level at all. Then I learned I had several of the variants that blocked the uptake of vitamin D. And with those, one had to take mega doses of vitamin D to bring your level to normal. And let me say, really low levels of vitamin D uh, are disastrous for individuals, bone uh, mineralization, uh, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, uh, asthma in younger people, and on and on. So putting together and integrating a clinical chemistry measurement with genome variation then gave us brand new actionable possibilities. And the actionable possibilities are now increasing in an exponential way. Over the first year of this program, I would say the the pioneers were incredibly enthusiastic. One, they loved the idea with knowledge they could make their own decisions. Two, they came to realize that genetics don't control your destiny, rather they can be, they can be reached around, at least in many different cases.
But most important, many people realized they weren't nearly as healthy as they thought they were. And in fact, if you had a spiral staircase of ascending wellness, and you use the actionable possibilities to bring you up the staircase, I would say most of the pioneers would have been uh, close to the bottom. And most of them uh, did move up this in a very, very nice fashion. What we hope to be able to do is to move people up this staircase of wellness to mimic the welderly that Eric Topol has studied, individuals in their 80s and 90s that have never been sick a day in their life never taken a drug, never been in a hospital, and they go into their 90s mentally alert and physically capable. And we think with all the new actionable abilities, uh, possibilities that come with the new data, that if people are willing to undertake a lifetime of scientific wellness, you can elevate yourself to this uh, very uh, august state. And of course, that's a hypothesis that remains to be tested. We started mid-2015, the company called Arafail, because so many of the original 108 pioneers wanted to con continue on. And the company has really been a success. We now have more than 4,000 individuals. We're in all states but for New York. And to date, we have now more than 100 wellness to disease transitions. And these are major opportunities I'll talk about in a few moments. And ISB and Aravel are working together to analyze all of the data. Now, the ch challenges for scientific wellness are, one, the cost of the assays. And my guess is in a five to 10 year period, that, that'll come down by a factor of 10. Lots of scaling, uh, miniaturization is uh, ongoing in many different places. The scaling of the coaches is really a challenge, obviously. And we think both avatars and software can enormously amplify their effectiveness. And how you recruit individuals is really about how you educate students as to the new kind of wellness so they'll be ready for these kind of opportunities. So in this regard, we started a clinical trial with 1,000 employees of scientific wellness uh, at Providence. And we're going to follow them for three years against a random control group and ask just two questions. One, can you formally verify you've really increased wellness after the first year of study? That is utterly uh, evident. And number two, what are all the ways scientific wellness can save the healthcare system money? And that's a point we'll return to at a later point in time. I hearken the data clouds of scientific wellness to the Hubble telescope. That is, they gave us a tool that allowed us to view human biology and disease with a resolution we never, ever had before. And I'll talk about four of the observations we've made that are absolutely fascinating. The statistical correlations, we found more than 3,500 of them in the initial 108 pioneers, and exactly the same has turned out to be true in the Aerofail data. And these correlations, that is, correlate into data bit in one of the six data types with data bits in any of the other six types, looked on the left like the hairnet until we said, let's create a program that will clip edges that indicate the lowest probability association. And that revealed more than 70 multi-omic functional domains that related either to physiology or to disease in fascinating ways. And in fact, here's one of those communities that's exploding out. It's the cholesterol community. There are 15 associated molecules there. Vitamin E is positively associated, uh, and uh, thyroxin is negatively associated. What's interesting is thyroxin was being tested uh, as a drug uh, by Lilly. And in fact, in looking at the other 70 communities, we found 10 interesting candidates that fell in the now being tested drug arena. And we have about 150 candidates that are potential drugs for the future. And of course, correlations lead to hypotheses. And through biological perturbations, those lead to mechanisms and biomarkers and potential drug targets but you have to do the biology. 
the correlations alone are not enough with big data. And that's one of the reasons, quite frankly, that uh, I think Watson failed so uh, globally with IBM's attempt to uh, give doctors what they need as assessed only by engineers. We can determine polygenetic risk for more than 100 diseases or so using the GWAS data. And of course, what these allow us to do in a very interesting way is take any set of individuals for which you have appropriate genomic sequence and rate them relative to the genetic risk for a single disease. That means you can take high-risk people for many common diseases, follow them very closely, look at transitions, and begin to reverse those diseases at the very earliest stage. But equally interesting, if you, as we did here, take the genetics of LDL cholesterol across the underdate individuals, we could show beautifully that cholesterol correlated beautifully in an ascending manner with higher genetic risk. That analyte plays into a mechanism. Statins, in reducing that analyte, operationally reduce the genetic risk in those individuals. And exactly, we're seeing exactly the same things on many other diseases. So this is inflammatory bowel disease where there's a beautiful negative correlation of cysteine with genetic risk. And what's interesting about cysteine is it is key in the synthesis of glutathione, and that's key in reducing oxidative stress, which is the major trigger for inflammatory bowel disease. So the intriguing question is, can we take high-risk people for inflammatory bowel disease, give them cysteine, and reduce their genetic risk? And we're beginning to look at that now. Aging is something that has fascinated people for a long, long time. And what we're able to do with 4,000 people is bin people according to decades, and then ask, what is the level of control for each of the major three classes of analytes? clinical chemistries, proteins, and metabolites. And what we see for all three is an ascending loss of the level of control. And without going into any details whatsoever, just let me say, we can use those data to estimate for individuals biologic age as opposed to chronologic age. And of course, the younger your biologic age is relative to chronologic age, the better off you are, and so forth. And the reason we think this is important is, one, we've averaged 1,000 analytes. Two, if we look at the uh, biological age of individuals with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, it's significantly higher than those without. And the inverse is true of people that do a lot, have a lot of exercise as compared with those that don't. So I think there are compelling reasons to think that at least the biological age is marking something real, and it's a metric we can use to optimize things. Wellness to disease transitions are one of the biggest benefits. Here, a 57-year-old woman, acute pancreatic cancer in uh, January of 17, four earlier blood draws. So what we did for each blood draw was to take the number of individuals in Aravale at that time and ask for each analyte, was it an outlier with respect to this woman? And we found in searching through the thousand or so, five or six outliers, including this one protein that gets successively higher as you get closer to the disease. It's a notch receptor component. It's specifically expressed in the cat, uh, uh, pancreas, and it's a great candidate. The next step we did was to take nine relevant biological networks and determine whether any of those had become disease perturbed across the four visits, the four different leads. And what we were able to show is that in the first visit, none were perturbed, and the second one was perturbed. In the third, we had two perturbed, and in the fourth, we had five perturbed. An exponential increase in those networks. So what that means is we can define wellness based on the nature of the individual in the cohort 
And we can use these divergent values together with expert systems to understand exactly where we're going to go in the future. And we think we'll be able to have a completely new approach to diagnostics there. So um, what I'd like to summarize by saying then is the preventive medicine of the 21st century will be to create biomarkers for each of the transitions and reverse them before you get to the disease process and so forth. So I'd just like to say, going back to scientific wellness, one, it's going to strikingly increase the health of the individual. Two, it's going to let us do these transitions, which are the beginning to understand how to reverse virtually all chronic diseases. And Alzheimer's is what we're starting with as the first example. And then finally, you can think about a lot of reasons why this is going to strikingly reduce the cost of medicine. So if this is so obvious, why don't more healthcare systems leap to it? And I'd say there are two reasons. One, leadership at the top that is worried only about money and how to go forward. And two, physicians that are extremely conservative about looking at the future. So I hope I've convinced you that the future of medicine is going to be very different from the past. Thank you.